Warning, the following Otaku Generation podcast has content of an adult and mature nature and is not necessarily safe for work or appropriate for children under the age of 18. If you are easily offended by content of this type, please stop this recording. Parental discretion is advised. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on Otaku Generation are those of the cast and crew and the individuals that express them and are not necessarily associated with the sponsors or guests of the show. Otaku Generation is a Red Apple production which is solely responsible for its content. All impressions are poorly impersonated. And please, for the love of God, don't try this at home. This is Derek the Red, and you're listening to the one and only Otaku Generation. What's Reesh? What's Bank? Well, you know who to thank. It's Ellen and the boys. So let's all make some noise. The yakking never gets old. Welcome to show 898. Hi, hello everyone. I am Alan. Hi, I'm Matt. And I am Paul. What's free? What's bang? What's squeak with the UG crew? Uh, so the only thing of note is that I I feel like I've been missing out on um, not seeing the Orville uh, series that I, I kind of liked. You know, it, it sort of stopped production during the pandemic, that it restarted production. Um, and they finally have been releasing um, season three. I think the 10th episode came out recently. So um, I guess we're at the end of <laughs> season three. That being said, the only place to see it is on TV, live TV, or to see it on Hulu. And, and I'm just not um, not a subscriber of Hulu anymore. So therefore, it, it's not something I was you know going to see. Normally, what you can do is once it's been fully released or near fully released, um, they allow it to be bought. Like I could buy the series on Amazon Prime and then, you know, I could watch it that way. Well, it turns out I happened to jump into uh, Disney Plus this weekend and there was the Orville complete series of the se- you know, season three. Yeah. And I forgot that uh, Disney had bought Fox Entertainment, the entertainment size of, of, of Fox. I guess we're going to start seeing uh, Orville characters show up at the MCU. I, d- I don't know. Um, they just have they have just about everything at this point. Um, that being said, uh, I uh, I've been happily sort of watching through. Uh, I have not finished uh, season. Um, I have not finished the seventh episode of season three yet, um, but I'm working on it. So um, I'm enjoying it. Um, I think it 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 is its own thing. Um, Paul, have you watched any Orville at all? So, so I know I've heard that it's good, but I just hate Seth MacFarlane so fucking. <laughs> I mean, I cannot stand anything he produced. So I know people say it's good. I just can't bring myself to believe it's good long enough to try to watch it. So here's my problem. In season one, there was a little try too hard for him to try to find his footing, right? Because he's known for just sort of a certain kind of humor and a certain kind of behavior. And season one has that in it. But then it has these couple little notes of good, good sort of what I would consider sci-fi in the the realm of like original Star Trek sci-fi kind of concepts and ideas. And, And there's there's a couple of those nuggets. And then they proceed to have more of those in season two when they're letting go of they they started to find their footing um and then season three it's real clear that they understand what they're doing here it now stands on its own as a series um that being said i've not gone back to rewatch season one and two so i i can't come with a recent perspective you could probably jump into um season three if you really care and and and, i mean there's already been some callbacks to things that will make more sense if you had watched the first two seasons. I think you could totally get through it. And I think there might be some stuff in there that you relate to in terms of the sci-fi story ideas that they're for the premises. So well, I could definitely use it right now because my um, my Star Trek uh, Adventures role playing game uh, campaign is going full tilt right now. Mm hmm. 
and uh, I've been re-watching TNG. I just finished up episode one, and I gotta say, it's hard to be uh, rougher going than TNG. Uh, <laughs> The, those uh, first it, few it, seasons of TNG are, are are very rough, but at the time but, it was amazing because we hadn't had anything for I don't know decades, oh, so long. But but even so, you know the thing is the sort of jankiness of that series. It really feels like an RPG session, right? It doesn't matter that everything is kind of weak because mm -hmm. you know if you get the players, that that's about all they can handle. So it doesn't matter that everybody's a cardboard cutout. It doesn't matter that everything's really obvious that all of the uh, sort of the, the conflicts are, you know, black and white right up there. We're going to stand up here and, uh, and uh, you know, chew the scenery a little bit and emote. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but, you know, it, it's still fun to watch. I mean, that series was such a part of growing up for me. You know, it's it's one of those things which has always been there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'll tell you, there's a lot more Trek I need to watch. I still haven't finished uh, Strange New Worlds, which is actually good, right? I mean, e everything I've seen of it has been great. Mm -hmm. So I, I need to finish up Disco. I am not going to finish Picard based on what I've heard. I just uh, mm -hmm. not going to do it. Yeah, uh, just I like, just never going to watch it. Highlander 2. Yeah. Um, so here here's the thing. There is... And I'd have to find, I'd have to look at like season season one of Orville. There's a particular episode with Boris that's sort of his backstory to his race, his planet, the way they are. Um, and there's a lot of coloring and humor with Boris in general. Then there is basically a updated callback from, I guess, season one into season two, which is episode four, that sort of ties those two, you know, together. Even in season one, there was some social commentary happening with the story writing, and now it feels even more relevant in current day. Hmm. Look, you want to look for Seth MacFarlane for what made him famous, that's one thing. I'm not going to defend the guy, but this is, I would say, falls in an area of something different. Yeah, see, I'm looking at season one. There's another callback from episode six from season one that definitely precedes, uh, you know, the find itself in season two a little bit and definitely in season three. I, uh, I'm i not opposed as much as probably your disposition is to the creator. But I would say, you know, jump into season three, maybe. And now, now um, I'm game to give it a shot at some point. Yeah. I, I appreciate that there probably is something there. Mm -hmm. It's just there's so much fucking media to consume these days, right? Yeah, but, you know, as we, we go through these things with the season reviews, you know, not all of it's amazing. I don't know. I guess, yes, it, it's it's episode 11 of season one. That's an interesting one, too. And I think that's a throwback to a book that I've never read about uh, a two-dimensional world. I think it was an essay or something. I don't think it was like a full-on book. Um, okay. But, you know, well, I've been enjoying that. I'll continue to enjoy the little bit at least season. I keep saying season. Episode 7 tonight. Um, and we'll, we'll see where I go with, uh, you know, then it'll be over that I won't have any more Orville for <laughs> potentially another year. So, uh, so yeah, anyhow, that's it. Those are the highlights for me. Everything else is um, moving stuff, family, things going on that uh, have been uh, interceding in my ability to stay focused on, on all the moving effort. So, but I got to keep, uh, you know, marching on. So that's, that's me. Uh, Matt, what about you? Uh, let's see. Um, well, since we haven't been doing What's Freesh for like the entire duration of the uh, season impressions, um, there's a couple of things that, that are coming up there that I've been doing or are coming up that I wanted to discuss. So, number one, Rick and Morty is coming back. Season six begins in uh, September 2022. Um, I know some of you guys are not all that big on Rick and Morty, but I found it to be an enjoyable uh, take on examining life issues. You know, Rick and Morty gets another season, but no more Venture Brothers. I mean, what the fuck, man? Yeah, I still hold out hope that that a like Venture Brothers movie can be produced that will, if not tie up all the loose ends, because this is Venture Brothers and everything is a loose end, but at least give us some closure on our main characters, all of the the various Venture Brothers pairs. Could it be Hank and Dean? 
Could it be Doc and Jonah Jr.? Could it be Doc Venture and the Monarch? I mean, there's all this stuff that's that's like swirling around in the Venture Brothers universe that could apply to the main title. Who knows? Hard to say. Hmm. Nope, that's fair. And you're you're correct. I mean, I did hear that we have maybe even a couple of movies in the works to wrap things up. But man, there's just, you know, with everything else that's coming out and being canceled immediately, it seems like Venture Brothers, which is one of the best animated series that has been made in America, not getting continues. It's just, just uh, you know, really grim. Yeah. Um, actually, speaking of that, um, that brings up the other another topic that I wanted to discuss, mm -hmm. and that is the recent merger of Discovery and Warner Brothers. And oh, consolidation that can only lead to good things for the we the consumer. Actually, no. Um, basically, in the high stakes world of corporate entertainment mergers. It's all about consolidation because that means you can eliminate redundancies and improve your bottom line and blah, de, blah, de, blah. But the large, large issue that, that has to do with these consolidations is that apparently there was a lot of corporate debt that needed to be expunged. And the people in charge of the new consolidated Warner Brothers Discovery have decided that canceling a shit ton of movies and animated series and streaming platforms is the way to go to diet themselves into financial um, prosperity. So that basically means that there is a whole shitload of stuff from Warner Brothers from Discovery, from basically everything under their umbrella that is getting killed in the name of we can, it's worth more as a tax write-off than it is as a, an ongoing money earning proposition. And this is one just l shitty behavior because I feel like they have an ethical duty to produce complete and then display the the works that they have hired people to make for them um the the two highest profile things about this are the batgirl movie which was literally in post-production when the axe came down and then there was the animated movie scoob which i'm not sure was going to be another citizen kane but at least by god Considering the crap they've pumped out into the marketplace over the years, it at least deserved to be born and have its shot in the marketplace without just being summarily written off for a tax write-off. Um, and it, the thing is, it's not just that, that Warner Brothers and the Discovery conglomerate is washing their hands of them. For, for them not to lose their tax rebate, They've got to kill them. They've got to throw them in the vault forever and never let them be seen or resold, or they will be seen to be taking financial profit off its existence, and they have to pay back their tax write-off. So, you know, this is the least creative creative accounting I've seen. Yeah, well, it's it's part of the whole thing that happens when a movie studio gets bought. I mean, if you ever like read the news about, you know, movies that that sort of got made but never released, a lot of the times the common theme in their history is uh, the movie the studio was in financial trouble, so they they put themselves up for sale, and then the new ownership wanted nothing to do with with stuff that was in the pipeline from the old regime it's like well if the old regime was doing so hot why did they need to sell their fucking movie movie studio huh all those movies probably suck plus i don't get any credit if they succeed because they were created aside from my my benevolent leadership so they will basically do everything they can to shit can 
you know, movie projects that they have no hand in creating. Or at the very least, they'll let them exist, but very significantly, they will get sat on for a year or two and then get released in February at the dump time so they don't get any serious movie viewership and they won't get any marketing and maybe they won't even get released in movie theaters. Maybe they'll just get dumped onto home video or these days it's maybe your streaming platform and not even home video. Mm. So there's, I'm sure a certain element of that in the new WBD uh, wheelhouse, but the, the rest of it was was basically like, well, shit, we've got a billion dollars of corporate debt that we've got to expunge somehow. And rather than putting out a whole bunch of movies that'll take years to earn back their, their costs, how about we just kill them? Kill them and take the tax write off, which is instant money now. It makes me think that maybe Amazon would have been a better um, new owner. Or Netflix, we don't know what the what the circumstances in Netflix, so they shouldn't be spending more money than they have income for. It would probably would have been a better destination for Prime Video, you know, and Amazon Studios. So, mm-hmm. um, Eddie L., uh, you said you had a couple things. So, what else did you have to talk about? Um, streaming services. There's a uh, lot of one. Them. <laughs> yeah, well, there's going to be fewer of them. Um, one of the Things that is interestingly enough a fallout from the Warner Brothers Discovery merger is that both of those entities, Warner Brothers and Discovery, have streaming services that they're affiliated with. Um, Warner Brothers had HBO Max, Discovery has its own Discovery specific streaming service. And in the wake of the merger and all the cancellations, that means that there's a whole lot of stuff. Um, that is all of a sudden not on the streaming platforms anymore. Um, part of those um, tax write-offs included canceling new seasons of series that were running on HBO Max, um, canceling things that were going to be released on HBO Max, uh, withdrawing things from HBO Max. And it's just heartbreaking. Yeah, so we have uh, apparently been feeling the seven weeks without what's free and are packing all the digressions into one episode. I just think this is horribly, horribly bad from a human perspective. Boy, I don't even remember what life was like before watching all of the new season anime because it really has been seven weeks uh, mm-hmm. because we had Otakon in there as well. Um, yeah, so I did do a binge of the show we're going to be discussing later today. Uh, from the current season, I've, uh, I think the thing I've been keeping up with is Parallel World Pharmacy. Mm-hmm. And I have to say that that show really shows its weaknesses compared to the show we're going to be talking about later. Uh, This is the one where we have a pharmacist who works himself to death and ends up in a parallel world where he is a pharmacist named Pharma working for a family of pharmacists in a land (laughs) where pharmacists are very important and are nobles, uh, though some of them are commoners. But nope, he's a noble. And, you know, they they do an interesting job of drawing on his real world knowledge. Uh, He can synthesize compounds just by thinking about them. Mm. But the show is really hamstrung by its uh, complete unwillingness to challenge the protagonist in even the slightest of ways. Uh, So when, you know, the Inquisition of this world in the most recent episode, you know, comes in and tries to kill him. Well, it turns out he is the most powerful magician ever. And so he just like ignores all their attacks. Uh. And then they're like, oh, wow, you must be a god. 
And it turns out, oh, yes, he's actually a god, even though he just wants to be an ordinary, everyday pharmacist healing all the people. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's it's fine for really <laughs> definitions of fine uh, and it's watchable. But, man, you just you just want so much more from a show. And this season is not delivering it. I tried watching another couple episodes of The Devil is a Part Timer, which I did enjoy well enough back uh, when the first season was coming out. But man, it's just um, kind of tedious. So, mm. um, so fortunately, we have burned through half of the current season. Uh, so it won't be that long until we get to see what fall will bring to us. Uh, is there anything else to mention? I've been playing a heck of a lot of uh, games on the Switch. Um, yeah, so 20 Minutes Till Dawn is a go-to. It's it's a vampire survivor-like, <laughs> which is... Uh, so, so basically, it's a game where you have just an incredible number of enemies coming at you from all sides. Uh, mm -hmm. In Vampire Survivor, you're, it's basically you auto-shoot, so you just move around, but you're always making attacks. And as you upgrade your character in sort of this roguelite way, uh, you get these new attacks. Uh, the, uh, 20 Minutes Till Dawn is a bit more of a twin-stick shooter. So mm -hmm. you are actually deliberately firing. You know, you aim with your left thumb stick or WASD on the keyboard. You uh, you aim with your right uh, uh, thumb stick or your mouse, and then you just shoot all the things. And there's a, a very nice progression where you get a random selection of of, of power-ups every time you gain a level, which happens with pleasing regularity. Uh, so you can't, you know, perfectly guide how a run is going to go. But if you know, you know, how the trees work, you can lean into a particular build. Uh, so there's like, you know, six or seven or eight different characters. They keep releasing new ones. They all have their own special power. There's different guns that shoot differently. And this game is like just about the perfect Switch game. Now, a, a run of this is, in fact, literally 20 minutes. There's a uh, sort of a, a quick version that you can beat in 10 minutes, uh, but is obviously not the full experience. And it actually takes a little longer than 20 minutes uh, because the, the, uh, the timer pauses while you are thinking about which power up you should take. Uh, but, you know, it's just a, a really, um, you know, low brain power, but interesting Twitch reflex game. Uh, so, so highly recommended if, uh, you know, obviously not to um, not, not much of a story there by any stretch, but, uh, but, uh, but I've, I've really been enjoying it. Um, I've, I've, I finally got around to checking out Baba is You, which is mm -hmm. a, a puzzle game. Uh, and it's a uh, sort of a, a, a low res aesthetic, you know, it looks like it could be from the eight or 16 bit era. Uh, you move a little character around the screen most of the time who is Baba. Uh, but the interesting thing is there are rules on the screen, things like Baba is you or door is open or key is unlock. And by you can actually ch move the blocks corresponding to these rules on the screen. So, like, if you suddenly change Baba is you to wall is you, suddenly all the walls on the screen move as you do. And if any of those walls make it into the tile, which a rule says is the win condition, uh, then you win. Uh, so it's some interesting sort of lateral thinking stuff. Uh, I, it's it's fun. It 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 has a very good reputation for a reason. Uh, I got stuck at one of the levels, haven't made it back to it, which is always a, a problem with games like this. You know, if you, you just kind of can't quite get one of the puzzles, you're blocked. Uh, though you do have some options for skipping a level for now and and moving on. 
so so yeah um, definitely another good one worth its reputation it's been out for like you know five or six years now so this is hardly uh, hardly a new release and the uh, sort of big ticket game I've been playing is Marvel's Spider-Man uh, which was a mm -hmm. PlayStation release and uh, quite a while back now but uh finally uh as of like last week or so got a release on steam and it's really good uh, <laughs> super far along but it's just brilliantly executed uh so an obvious point of comparison is the the rocksteady uh batman arkham games uh, which I was actually playing a bit of on the Switch. And that was a mistake, like playing Batman right before playing Spider-Man. Like the, the feel is just different enough. So like when Batman is moving around Arkham City, he is he's got like this grapnel gun. So mm -hmm. he'll like fire it to latch onto a roof. And then the, 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 the motor, the engine kicks in, he goes flying. Whereas, you know, Spidey, is you know flinging the webs around and timing you know i'm going to let go here so it's just like a rhythm thing right so yeah it just, it, it's, it, it's it's all it's unpowered cheap. it's all natural yeah so so it's a thing where you know you, you play two things it's like trying to learn french and spanish at the same time you're always uh, going to be messing up you know the the easy stuff like the you know your definite articles yes and no all that stuff um but it, it's it's great plays decently on the switch plays brilliantly on my uh, main pc um and the, the fighting feels good um uh, feel and and the writing is great from what i've seen so far so as i said not super deep into it but uh, so far highly recommended and uh, I guess I, uh, you know, so many things I could talk about over the last seven weeks here. But the last one I'll mention is this past week I took a day off mm -hmm. to head down to a role playing game store in Delaware that I had never been to, and that is Days of Nights in Newark, Delaware. All right. Have you have you been there, Matt? I know you go down to Delaware occasionally to do some comic book shopping and the like. Um, yes, but I've never been to that store. Um, so what was your impression of it? So, um, uh, it, it is, they actually focus on used role-playing game books, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the greater Philadelphia area, we actually have a few decent role-playing game stores. We've got Showcase Comics uh, with a couple locations, though one of them does much better on role-playing than the other. We have one of the two remaining locations for... Uh, the complete strategist which once you know span the east coast but now is is down to the their flagship location in manhattan and another in king of prussia and oh, i've been uh, to that one okay well actually uh quick aside since we're doing digressions today uh that that store the the complete strategist in king of prussia is where i found out about the uh suburban otaku squad anime club because there was a, a sign up there and I was there and, you know, think if things had gone slightly differently that day and I had found a role playing game uh, that mm -hmm. was looking for a new player, I might have ended up doing that. But I found SOS Anime Club and I showed up and that has uh, been like the last 20 years here, right? Yeah, <clears throat> because it was local to us. Uh, lobster, lobster pig, Paul. Big Paul uh, and Aaron would go there a lot because it was, you know, right around the corner. Basically, it was our local sort of store. And that's actually where I bought things like Carcassonne and Ticket to Ride and, and games like that. Uh, I've not been in there in a while, though I, I drive past there all the time. So it's just mm -hmm. interesting that we do actually have a store. Um, and they have a little bit of a space in the back. And if you're into miniatures and stuff like that, they have a lot of material. But yeah, no, they, they are totally legitimately a place for um, role-playing game materials. Yeah, and, and I love them, right? I mean, they have a huge back stock. I mean, this stuff was all purchased new, but, you know, there's like decades of unpurchased role-playing games there. Mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. not, and a, it's not cool a humongous store, right? It's a fairly tiny store. Yeah. And and the same with Showcase Comics, which is indeed more of a comic store, but they also have new stock. 
and uh you know and but but lots of board games lots of miniatures you know that's clearly where more of the money is but you know they stock interesting stuff it's not just you know a shelf of D and then some magic cards right so they, they actually go to <laughs> the effort to you know scare up interesting indie games small press stuff you know they buy into kickstarters to get uh the retailer packages uh so i found cool stuff at both of those but you know ever since i've left michigan i have not had a good go-to store to just like go and dig through all of the weird shit that people have dumped from their role-playing game collections and uh days of nights is that store so they have lots of other stuff they've got models they've got all sorts of board games i don't care about that i just care about the role-playing games and they have a solid uh you know few sort of long shelving units of used role-playing games and i found them online i was trying to find a copy of ars magic ars magica fifth edition Mm -hmm. the most recent version of the 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 classic game of medieval magicians like doing research right that's the weird thing about this game like if you're a magician in this game you the, the best thing you can do is just like sit in your castle or study and research new stuff and then all of your companions go out to do all the adventuring and every so often you know you'll you'll head out to to do something major mm -hmm. uh so it was one of the games that originated troop play but i was listening to mage the podcast about the uh, white wolf um uh mage the ascension and mage the awakening games from the uh, world of darkness universe and they had an, an episode sort of saying here's the things that mage which is a very interesting game in its own right took from ars magica so I played a bit of Arch Magica, I think it was second edition back in the day. But like the guy out there got me really interested in fifth edition. So <laughs> it's done. There's like 40 books published for it. And uh, but but like they aren't being printed anymore. You know, the run is done. They're <sighs> so, so what's out there is what there is. I'm like, okay, well, let's let's see. And I checked showcase comics i checked um I, I checked a complete strategist i checked online retailers and it was impossible to find a copy of the core book for ars magica fifth edition but oh. but uh, I, I don't know what prompted me to do it but days of nights actually has a great online uh ordering thing so you could actually look at all the stuff they have in stock which is amazing because most stores don't do that uh mm. noble knight which is one of the biggest sort of retailers of used role-playing games does a great job of that and i have to say i buy way too much from them i <laughs> once it hits collector levels i i can usually hold myself back but it's like you know some obscure thing that's been out of print for you know 10 years and you know, they've got one copy and it's on my want list and it's like can i resist this no i cannot resist this <laughs> uh but but no I, I visited days of nights took a took a day off from work um uh my wife and i had a picnic you know packed up and went down and i loaded up on stuff and it was actually great so i am super impressed with this store this is now one of my very favorite friendly local gaming stores Yay. So so definitely, I mean, if you are within any sort of driving distance, now that I have done my first pass and gotten the stuff I really needed, I can safely recommend it re recommend it to you, the listener. Um Yay. so yeah, so I've got picked up some like old uh, West End games, Star Trek books for like 10 bucks a pop as opposed to 60 bucks on Noble Knight. Uh, mm -hmm. including a copy of no Dis no disintegrations uh, which is a set of bounty hunter adventures uh, i actually found a copy of hero quest glorantha which is as near as i can tell impossible to find at this at this point so so mm. yeah i'll be making many trips back there in the future okay i do have one more thing to mention oh yes mention it then um i went to the movies the other day to actually see the movie bullet train oh. um 
which I thought was a fun movie. It's it's basically about um, a journey on uh, the the Japanese bullet train, which is not actually called bullet train in Japanese. It's called the Shinkansen, which is just like mainline train or something like that. Um, but the basic idea is that it's sort of a Tarantino pulp fiction Guy Ritchie snatch type of movie where you've just got a bunch of particular strange characters uh, running around at cross purposes on the train. They're all criminals. They're all like assassins and thieves and stuff like that. And then there's a kidnapping plot and a ransom in a suitcase and old grudges being settled. And it's it's one of those shows where um, weird things happen on bizarre turns of luck. Um, so you've got a couple of English, or I don't want to say English, but I guess British assassins who are there to sort of bring home a, a kidnapped gang leader's boss and his ransom. And then there's a guy who's dispatched to steal the ransom not knowing that it's a ransom he's just told to steal a piece of luggage off the shinkansen and that's the gig and there's even sort of a clerk's element to it in that he's like i'm not even supposed to be here some other guy was supposed to do this job and he called out sick and now i get tapped at the last minute to 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 like do this like cake run and of course he gets wrapped up in all sorts of you know shenanigans and and whatnot so it's uh it was an interesting fun movie it's definitely not something that you should take very seriously um but the action is good the plots are just all over the place i i appreciated the the like twists and turns of the plot although i'm i'm sure a lot of other people would say it's just kind of arbitrary and stuff just happens i prefer to think of it as twists and turns and plot developments. So um, the action is also good. This is directed by David Leach, one of the 8711 guys who um, co-directed John Wick. He worked on Deadpool 2, worked on a lot of other really good action movies, has done stunt work himself, a stunt coordinator. And I think he, he did a good job with this movie. So I would recommend it. Hmm. Sounds like a sounds like a good watch. Sounds like one right up my alley, in fact. Yay. Before I forget, a uh, couple things of note. So Wakashi had, had put together a, a thank you for, you know, I sent him some stuff and he sort of in return said, you know, thank you and put put this little like, you know, art together. It was kind of cool. It's really just the, I guess the three of us. Cool enough that I'm going to make a small batch of posters. So um i it's did. a great job it really is i did and at least you and matt are getting some and he's getting one Yay. um but they haven't arrived yet so i don't know maybe the first batch is terrible pretty freaking awesome that he did that and uh I was, it's quality oh, yeah. enough i hope that it turns out to be some nice movie poster you guys will have to bring your own frame but that being said yeah. okay and then uh new colin luke came out uh this past week so or sunday basically so okay I think we we've chatted a while. Oh, haven't we just? Yeah. Um, so why don't we jump into the topic this week, which is the topic this week is Yusha Yame Mas Sugi no Shokba wa Majo, or I'm quitting heroing. Next gig is at the Demon Queen's castle. Um, English title is just I'm quitting heroing, and this is. Uh, sort of a fantasy role-playing kind of universe. The basic idea is that you've got a, a medieval kingdom with magic and the human kingdom is being besieged by an invasion from the demon world um, led by the demon queen Echidna, um, which, if you are familiar with your biology, is a sort of hedgehog-looking monotreme. Um, but in Greek mythology was actually a, a half woman, half snake monster. So presumably it's taken from Greek mythology 
and not the small, timid monotreme. <laughs> but anyway, Demon Queen Echidna has invaded the human realm and she's marching on the capital city and things are looking grim for the human beings until the great hero leo steps up and he forms a party of unlikely friends and adventurers and they set off to defeat the demon army and the demon queen her terrible four generals and he succeeds in fact, he finds out that most of the other members of his party are not as powerful as him, and he dumps them about halfway through the quest, and he just continues on solo, and yet still manages to defeat the demon army, the terrible four generals, and the demon queen, all by himself. Because he's just that cool. But it turns uh, out being that cool has a downside, Oops. Because people, you know, when you are all powerful, it turns out people think you might be corrupted absolutely. Or are at least kind of scary and weird. Yeah, and it basically comes down to the the populace are really one glad that the demon army, the terrible four generals, and the demon queen are vanquished. Although technically he didn't kill all of them. He he sort of he defeated most of them and then they ran away. Um, but then they're like, he defeated the demon army, the four generals and the queen all by himself. Holy crap. This guy is too dangerous to be like trusted. So when he gets back to the to the kingdom. There's no ticker tape parade. There's no feast. There's no offer of comely maidens and flagons of mead. There's instead sort of like half-hearted yay and a whole lot of uh, And the whispering starts. And by the time Leo the hero gets back to, to the castle... The fix is in. The people do not trust him anymore. And basically he is discharged from the king's service as like his head knight and hero of the realm. And he is basically cast off to his own devices. And there's not a whole lot for out-of-work heroes to do in the absence of you know threats to the human realm there is not a whole lot for him to actually do in this world so he just sort of wanders around wanders around finding no friendship no home no companionship and just sort of taking one further step along the road to homelessness. And after a while of this, he's he's like, well, I've got to get back in the game. And if the king won't hire me to defend the realm, I guess I'll have to hire on with the demon queen to conquer it. And that's what he tries to do. Episode one is he marches up to the shattered and slowly rebuilding Citadel of Evil. And uh, and he gets an audience with the Demon Queen and her terrible four generals and starts laying out basically the medieval equivalent of a PowerPoint presentation about what a good hero he is. He's not only a skilled warrior, he's a he's a, an invincible sorcerer. He's very good with logistics and p personnel management. <laughs> and he's certain that if they give him a job and a place to sleep and meals, he could be just a Jim Dandy asset <laughs> to getting the Demon Queen's army back on its feet so it can conquer the world of men. And to be fair, 
in an extraordinary display of self-control, or maybe just a slow burn temper, the demon queen Echidna actually lets him finish with most of his pitch before just trying to destroy him with an unceasing stream of fireballs. Uh, Though, of course, as he is like the most powerful person ever, that has exactly zero effect aside from, you know, mild embarrassment all around. Well, you don't think he's going to walk into the throne room of the demon queen without having like defensive magics prepared. Duh. Uh, so basically, the terrible four generals are actually not all that terrible once you get to see them up close. There's like the the demon sorceress Subire, who is sort of like a succubus, but she's basically like their big magic gun and chief administrator. They've got the powerful dragonborn warrior. Um, and then they've got the guy who is, you know, the world's greatest assassin, who's sort of a disaffected human being who joined up with the demon army. And then you've sort of got this little beast girl like the the cat girl character and for some reason she's one of the generals of the demon queen's army i guess she's like what the princess of the demon people of the beast people yeah and can, trans and can transform into the great wolf fenrir oh okay so she can hulk out that's that's her big skill um except that she's like 10 years old <laughs> yeah and and uh, thinks like a 10 years old, except for the fact that she is utterly besmitten of our hero because he defeated her in single combat. And therefore, by the rules of her tribe, they must get married. Um, yeah, sort of a Red Sonia um, shampoo of the Chinese Amazons kind of vibe going on there with that. Um, and so basically after Echidna blasts leo the hero with with every bit of magic she can come up with still doesn't kill him she throws him out and tells him to never come back although i'm not really sure what she could do if he did come back but he leaves dejected and outside the throne room the four generals meet up with him and say come and talk with us <laughs> Because it turns out that following the defeat of the uh, of the invasion, a lot of the ranking demon generals were, you know, very badly injured by Leo the hero, and so they have retreated through the portal to the demon realm, and they are going to lick their wounds, and maybe come back, maybe not. They're not really keen on getting their butts whipped in the human world. So it's down to the four of them and the queen to rebuild their defeated army and still try and conquer the human realm. And uh, they're like, we're having a tough time of it. <laughs> and we really could use an invincible warrior who is also a great sorcerer and not incidentally a fantastic people manager yes and that's one of the er ironic and amusing things about this series is that the series is not about fighting and conquering things this is about rebuilding the army and leo um and inducted on a probationary unpaid intern basis and he must wear a disguise at all times lest the demon queen see who he really is and smite him is sort of brought on board as like a black knight and administrative assistant to the four generals and what he does is he's like okay uh you need to start interviewing people to rebuild your organizational structure and we need to um improve the morale of the defeated demon army and we need to develop um 
steady logistical support for your army and all of these things, which are just basically kind of like being a good manager 101. It's like, okay, we've got the, the chief sorceress who's like doing all this magic stuff and administering a lot of things. And she's just exhausted from overwork. And he's like, you've got to delegate. Let me show you how to properly delegate things. And he starts, you know, training people, giving them like magic gigas, and then promoting them to it's like, okay, you, you're the new mana reactor replenishment team. That's one thing the sorceress doesn't have to do all the time. Let's talk to the guy who's training the army and figure out his issues because he thinks he's not doing a good job because the army was defeated. Admittedly, they were defeated by the world's greatest warrior, but he needs to realize that just because he's a great warrior, that doesn't necessarily inform how you would manage an army of people who aren't as good as you. And the beast girl is running logistics. She knows nothing about running logistics. So she needs to be trained. She just needs to, to get the lowdown on why this is important and what you need to do to have it work right. And he even sits down and he talks with the with a disaffected human assassin and finds out, you know, what's his motivation? Why would a human being throw his lot in with the demon army? And, you know, it's it's actually kind of sad because he's had his terrible life where he was sold as sold into slavery as a baby, and then eventually um, bought by the Assassin's Guild not to be raised as an assassin, but basically to be killed as an expendable killer. And then he was good enough that he managed to survive his first, you know, expendable suicide mission and rose up through the ranks. And he's basically like, I hate humanity. Humanity has been nothing but awful to me. And I want to see the demons conquer them. And he's actually upset that the demon queen is not a hard ass. She has actually got a goal. She's not just conquering the human world to be evil. She's not even really trying to kill that many human beings. She's actually taking over territory and administering it fairly. And it turns out that what she's seeking is a magic artifact that the human beings have and they don't really know how to use but it's a holy artifact from the ancient days and they're not just going to give it to a demon queen if she walks up and asks for it nicely and that's the weird thing about this like you once you're on the side of the of the demon army you're just like man i've i've been in role playing campaigns where the player characters were worse people than this yeah, and there's there's clearly a bit of irony there because the the demon queen is a good ruler, and her 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 four great generals are kind of lovable doofs. <laughs> and, but so 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 Alan, you should probably get the uh, spoiler uh, stinger queued up here uh, because there's a twist, and I really did not expect this series to become as serious as it did um and it and also i didn't expect it to lean as hard into its premise as i did uh they really don't telegraph that in the first half of this show so this this show mm. is really in two halves uh and the first half it you know kind of reminds me of uh, moshi dora which was a show from about a decade ago uh, it's uh what if a what if the female manager of a high school baseball team read drucker's management uh mm. which is about using peter drucker's management tasks responsibilities and principles to manage a high school baseball team and you know it feels very much like that where you have you know this all-powerful dude who nonetheless is a folksy yet relatable 
person who nonetheless knows a lot about how to manage and motivate people because he's been around the block a couple of times. Mm, mm. And, you know, but they they take a hard turn to the left as of about episode uh, like seven, I'd say, mm. as we start to see the background of Leo. So uh, let's just give like our quick impressions about whether, you know, we think this is worth recommending. And then we are going to get deep in the spoiler territory here. Uh, surprisingly, I would recommend this. I mean, it's uh, it, it starts off as, as basically sort of a, an FRPG style fantasy action comedy and and it's it's basically like well what if the the like great hero defects to the to the evil army and that's the joke um but you find out once you get past the joke that there's a lot more i won't say a lot of substance to it but there mm. is substance to it there is a there is this this idea that we're going to treat this seriously that these invaders are not just invading because they're evil and evil people take over the world because that's what they do because they're evil you know just sort of that circular logic they're just there to to be bad guys to be mowed down by the heroes and that's basically all the characterization they really need yeah how about how about you alan what did you think of this one this was not something that really engaged me too much i found that pretty formulaic it seems like there's just things that happen uh, i was just sort of waiting for it to say ha ha we're at izakai it felt like it was just sort of going through motions a lot of the time well there was more character development than than our typical shows that we've been sort of going through um i'll give it that um, there is definitely some dynamic there, but for me, it's kind of hard for me to recommend it. it. It didn't, I didn't feel engaged in the whole process of it. I wouldn't have ever picked this up to watch it, uh, if we were doing it as a show topic. So mm -hmm. I'm probably the negative one between the two of you, because Matt, <laughs> you seem to find a lot of depth in this. I'm very indifferent on it. I don't think it's the worst waste of your time, but I also <laughs> didn't find anything so deep and meaningful about it then maybe we'd want to invest a lot of energy in it. So it, it's worth pointing out, this is not, in fact, an isekai, right? Which is one of the things to recommend it. And certainly the first half of the series is much tropier than the second half. Um, you know, it, mm. uh, it, it feels a lot more predictable in the first half as they're kind of setting you up for when they you know, start attempting to uh, knock out the supporting struts. Uh, yeah. So at this point, should we say into the spoilers? Spoiler warning, yeah. Okay, here we go. Oh, and actually, I should, before you do that, I will say, you know, this is a solid series. You know, this is not life-changing. It's not fantastic, but it's pretty good. You know, it undercuts itself a few times, but I like this way more than I was expecting to from the first couple of episodes. I was like, okay, this is this is this is okay. I can watch this while you know, it, you know, in my uh, sort of uh, I'm, I'm washing the washing the dishes. You know, this is a, a washing the dishes show. But as it were <laughs> not, you know, when, once we, we once we cross that episode, the boundary to episode seven, it's like. Okay, I really want to keep watching this. And you know, I there were things where you know I just wish they'd made slightly different choices, but on the whole, you know, some solid melodrama and mm. and it really, you know, bought into what it was trying to do. So worthwhile recommend. Okay. With that being said, here's a spoiler warning. There are spoilers coming. If you haven't seen the film yet, better fast forward right away. Thank you, Bernard. Okay, moving on. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. So, one of the things that we start finding out in the bottom end of the series is that there's a reason why Leo... Uh, What's his full name? Leo Demonheart. Uh, what a name. Totally not a problem, even though he's humanity's hero. 
yeah there's a reason why he's humanity's hero and it's like because uh he is tremendously old he doesn't look like it he looks like he's about 20 or 21 or something like that but apparently he is nigh immortal in that years and years ago the fantasy world was our world it was you know modern day tokyo when all of a sudden this portal cracked open in the ground in the middle of town and demons started coming out or demonic creatures started coming out because they were basically of monstrous form but there was there was not like this goal that they were there to conquer the human realm initially they were there because hey a portal opened up or we've opened up this portal to another world let's explore it and it took a while before thing before relations between humanity and all the demon races sort of broke down like there were demons who were good demons who were neutral demons who were bad um there were you know demons who who were in favor of just coexisting with humanity um and so there was there were good and bad people on both sides it seems but eventually things went south and it basically turned into there's not room in this dimension for the both of us someone's got to go and unfortunately the demons were much more powerful they had magic abilities they were large and strong and unless you outnumbered demons like 10 to 1 the people would lose and Eventually, the people were like, well, if we can't just beat them with technology and home field advantage, we got to come up with something better to fight them with. And what they came up with was the Demon Heart Warriors. They basically created a series of artificial beings who were great warriors, who specialized in some particular aspect of warfare and they they basically fought the demons and fought the demons and eventually the demons were were driven back um unfortunately in the process all of the demon heart warriors were killed except for leo um partially due to luck and partially because his warrior specialty was learning and adaptability he wasn't the most powerful one to start off with but he he had that that battle skill where when he fought somebody he never forgot what their technique was and once he knew your technique he could probably beat you using it or at least defend against it so he could he could eventually win and as he fought more and more demons, he got more and more proficient at defeating them. And he learned more skills and he got more, you know, battle swag. And he just basically was able to rack up experience points on a, on a near continual basis. And because he was an artificial being, he couldn't really just die of old age. So he just sort of persisted and got more skilled and got more stuff and learned more things and we find out um over the course of the series that that basically this world is earth it's it's the old world 3000 years ago this was earth of the modern day and now that the demons are here or the portal is opened i was never quite clear on this there's magic on earth now there's sorcery and you know if you learn that then you have yet another weapon to fight demons with and uh and that's why leo is the hero of the realm because he was created specifically to fight demons and save humanity and you know protect the world and uh it's it's kind of like in Groundhog Day, I think, where Bill Murray is 
is saying that uh, that that he is supremely skilled in in functioning in the town of Punxsutawney, because not because he's anything special, but because he's just seen it all. He's had enough time to learn everything, to practice everything, to figure out the exact right timing of everything. And, you know, maybe that's why God is God. It's not because he's special. It's just because he knows everything because he's been around forever. And that's kind of the, the situation with Leo Demonheart. Yeah, and it's a it, and it's a bit of a turn as you as you realize that sort of he's been you know, sort of playing it folksy for the first half of the series, and he's had a plan all along, and the plan it, you know comes down to the fact that after three thousand years he is effectively the most dangerous creature to exist he is the biggest threat to humanity that is or ever could be but due to his programming and sort of an isaac asimov you know three laws of robotics sort of deal uh you know he could he can't just kill himself because he has to protect humanity so he has to engineer something whereby humanity will be protected but he will be removed as a threat um yeah and that's that's sort of the the like scary side of this is is it's like he's not of any use in a peaceful world his whole thing is to exist in a world of war and chaos and to pull humanity's nuts out of the fire and he is self-aware enough to realize that if he destroys the demon army and finally saves the world once and for all, he's not going to have anything to do. And he is really seriously worried that if there is no world threatening menace, he will have to foster a world threatening menace for solely for the purpose of fulfilling his purpose and defeating a world threatening menace. Sort of Munchausen by proxy with the whole world as the proxy. And and we see this, we, we lead up to it, but we actually get to see where he was right on the edge of unleashing sort of a plague of, you know, of, of beings like him to threaten humanity in order to give him a reason to exist when the demons attack. And he suddenly realizes, oh my God, I am the baddie. And uh, it's it's a moment of realization for him. And uh, it, it kind of leads to the current situation where he is hanging out with the demon army basically to, to like take their measure, to figure out like, are they actually just evil for the sake of being evil? Mwahaha ha ha ha. And it's like, no, um, the reason Echidna is invading the human kingdom is because the demon realm uh, is in bad shape. It's it's a horrible, blasted wasteland. Their their ecology is destroyed. There's very little food. The ground is barren. the The demons are all desperate to survive and they fight each other all the time because there's just nothing to give them any respite from from their dire circumstances and what she wants is something called the philosopher's stone which the humans have and and it's her belief that that the the philosopher's stone is is some kind of sampo it's something that will give them a cornucopia of of food and it will help rehabilitate the environment it will bring the weather back under control it will give 
hope to the beleaguered citizens of the demon realm. And that's why she's conquering the human realm, not because she wants to conquer the human realm. It's just because she wants this artifact to take it back home and rehabilitate her own planet. And that's the reason why she's not um, slaughtering humans left and right. Uh, she's actually treating the territory that she takes during her invasion with with you know pretty enlightened administration, honestly. Uh, like there's a there's a flashback to to the invasion where uh, the people are actually doing better under the demon invasion than they were under the corrupt royalist administration. Because there's this one thing where they, they go in and they conquer a town and they find out that the corrupt mayor has been hoarding food and, of course, taxing the peasantry to their down to their socks. So when they conquer, quote-unquote, conquer the place, they throw open the castle, they redistribute the wealth, and they give food to the peasants. And the peasants are like, you know, for demons, you guys are actually pretty nice. We'd like to throw you a feast. Yeah. Um, and as we've mentioned, the, the terrible four generals are actually kind of doofuses once you, you get down to it. It's like, well, they believe in the goal of rehabilitating the demon realm, and that's why they're, be, they're supporting Queen Echidna. And they're not really particularly effective. Uh, as the leaders of a giant army of variegated demons, you know, it's like, well, yeah, you've got a really good sorceress, but that's all she is. And you've got the really great dragon blood warrior, but that's all he is. He's not much of a general. He's a great warrior, not a great general. The sorceress is a great sorceress. She's not a great general. Um, you know, the, the beast girl, yeah, she can turn into a giant monster, but again, not really general material. And then you've sort of got the the like PTSD assassin, and he's not a general material either. He's basically there to like kill people by stealth and sneak around and spy on things. So he's a great spy and assassin but he's not really a good general. <laughs> yeah. And, and so the series really sort of leans really hard into that. So as, as, as Leo has engineered sort of this perfect moment where if everything goes right, he can be killed. You know, they, mm -hmm. the, the, the demon queen Echidna needs the philosopher's stone and he has, that philosopher's stone because it is his power source and i actually really like the way that he's like oh yeah i was made to look like a human male but i'm not really anything mm. and you know having him not be the 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 universally presented um you know young girl living weapon was a nice change of course at various points in this show he he makes unwanted sexual comments to um to to the uh, sorceress in particular commenting on how he's ogling her breasts while watching her work which you know just doesn't fit in with the rest of this show and they they then back off from that for almost the entire show aside from like the weirdness of this 10 year old beast girl saying oh yes i'm gonna marry you uh which she says basically every single episode until the end yeah uh, well and, to ahead. be fair um the sorceress is technically a succubus which means that she's all about seducing human men and stealing their souls Although she never really seems to be doing that. Uh, and she, finds it, she finds it, in fact, very embarrassing to have that mentioned. Yeah. And I think he's just mentioning like mentioning that because she's supposed to be like this supernatural seductress preying on men. And she's not really into it. And I think that's why he, he keeps like nailing her with the, 
with these teasing comments about her looks basically to like annoy her and sort of like keep her off balance because it's not something that she's really into. Well, so I, you know, I, I, I wish that were the case, but you see this at the end of the series as well. I'm not sure you made it all the way to the end Matt, where you have mm. this like dopey banter back and forth with the demon queen, Echidna and Leo, uh-huh. where, you know, they're just like at each other's throats because she cannot tolerate him. And he's talking about how, yes, she's the one who really understands, but, you know, she just wants to destroy him like nobody's business because that's <laughs> funny. Right. And and yeah. they can't back off from the shtick long enough to like really stick the landing. They came mm. so close all the way through. Uh and and they took it farther than you thought they were going to, given how the first part of this series went. And like this entire episode where you know Leo is, you know, just about to be defeated, we see his entire backstory. And at the end, you know, the four great generals and Queen Echidna come together to, you know, land that killing blow. Mm-hmm. And, and decide if you know they're going to rip the uh you know the the beating um arc reactor from his chest. <laughs> um and you get the obvious ending for a show like this i mean they are not actually pushing it that far you know it's the it's the comedy happy ending oh yes haha they're such good friends and you know but that's okay it's just it felt like you know, just a, a little more workshopping, a little more, okay, we have dodged a bunch of tropes during this. If we could just peel off a few more, we're actually going to have a solid series here. Um, well, I'm looking at this, and uh, according to the to the Wikipedia page, there's like three light novels of this. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if, oh, and there's like six volumes of manga. So I'm wondering if 12 episodes was really enough to get through the whole series is there going to be like a season two of i'm quitting heroing coming down the pike uh, which so could if, if so i haven't heard about it you know it's certainly possible but you know this was really the main story mm. while it could be continued you know this it, it, it's really one of those things where you know this was the main story that they wanted to tell mm. And uh, you can do more in this world, but it's going to be sort of stepping back. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm I, I'm not super excited for a second season of this. I enjoyed this single season. Uh, it was better than I expected, but you know, I can't see more actually delivering something that I'd want to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, let me give some links. OGLink.com slash 6EB, uh, 6EC, and 6ED. Uh, that will take you to a high dive to the wiki and to ANN. Um, um, yes, and apparently uh, Sentai Filmworks has the license for this. They're producing a dub in English, hmm. and it is also being released on Blu-ray. Or has it been released on Blu-ray already? I, I don't know. I have not, not looked at yeah, it. Yeah, I haven't uh, checked the uh, physical releases. I, I did not like it that much. This is not a series for the ages. You know, this was, this was perfectly fine as transient yeah. entertainment. I would recommend checking it out if you're looking for a show to watch. But, you know, I'm not going to be running out to buy this for the permanent collection to re-watch every five years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Um, well, let's see. There's... When was this released? Uh, recently, uh, in terms of anime, in terms of history, as far back as 2017. Um, no, ANN has uh, something about the home video release. It says, yeah. uh, anime will ship in two Blu-ray disc or DVD boxes on June 24th and August 24th, containing all 12 episodes oh. and a new two-part anime called Don't Lose Sight of Why We Took This Research Trip. <laughs> Okay. So I'm yeah. guessing it's just a, a side story with more yeah, that was, character banter. That's what I'd expect. Yeah, which means that I guess the timing on the release of this will be basically this upcoming week. So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. One, two, three days. Probably the day we release, right? Doesn't that make sense? 24th mm-hmm. is Wednesday. Is that true? 
That is true. So, uh, uh yeah. So the Wednesday that the show drops today. is allegedly when the the home video is is finishing out. So. Yeah. Um. Okay. Um. What uh, What is there to cover that we haven't covered? Uh, the the art's fine. I mean, it's not you know super exciting. It's um, not terrible. Music, you know, the ending and opening, I think, work pretty well, particularly as the series sort of ramps up with its in its uh, intensity and emotional intensity. Like, you know, that that ending when it hits actually really was working for me. Uh, you know, it was like giving me a little bit of that angst I was feeling when I was watching a really good series back in the nineties. Mm. Um, and it, so, so, but you know, it's it's fine. Um, I, I mean, from a production perspective, I don't know that I, more than that there's anything in particular to to comment on. Matt, what did you think? Um, I was surprised at how much I was getting into this watching it. Um, I mean, when we watched the episode one of this. And the impressions shows, I was like, oh, that's a wacky premise. Um, I might watch a few more episodes of this to to like see how they develop it. Um, but I was surprised at how um how much they raised the stakes in the second half of the season. Mm -hmm. And uh it uh, it turned out to have you know a little more depth than I was really honestly expecting out of a sort of like a fantasy you know comedy rpg style adventure show yeah in fact i actually can't remember watching the first episode during impressions i don't know if this is one that i missed because very occasionally there'll be one that we watch and i won't actually make it through it i try to hit them all <laughs> i don't always uh, but i seriously did not remember watching the first episode of this one i remember mm -hmm. the name so that means that I definitely watched it, <laughs> yeah. which is also why, like, just by name alone, is like sounds like an isekai. Um, but you know, not an isekai. We have to comment. It, it, this is yeah. it, it's a, it's such a fucking relief. I tell you. <laughs> yeah, but like I said, I, you know, I made my comment about it earlier. Um, okay, so if there's nothing more, then I guess we could probably get to closure. Yeah, wrap it up. Okay. Yay. For all things we've mentioned, please visit our website, www.talkgeneration.net or ognetworks.tv. Uh, you want to come in and hang out with us in Discord, you can do that, oglink.com slash Discord. You want to become a supporter, uh, oglink.com slash Patreon or Patron. Um, yeah, you want to email us, you can do that, um, attack.generation at gmail.com. Okay, I pulled out a white slip of paper. Dun, dun, dun. All right, what does this say? Oh, I guess I gotta get my camera out for that. Yes, tell us, Alan, what is our fortune for the upcoming week? Uh, work, How should we live our lives? Work is the elixir of life. The busiest man is the happiest man. Oh, man. So this is basically a simp for capitalism. I mean, this is not even a fortune. I mean, this is not even an aphorism. It's like, suck it up, man. You know, you need to, to be slaving at your job. You know, you need to just lean into working for the man because that's what's going to make you happy. Keep your head down, stay in your lane. This is not a fortune. This is an act of class aggression. <laughs> we need to raise our fists and fight against false fortunes of this kind that are trying to keep we the workers down paul are you working on your uh your how to write a fortune a good fortune workshop for oticon <laughs> <laughs> future tense that's all it takes future tense <laughs> uh yeah god's gonna kill you yeah well um that being said there you go that was it uh you got the the proclamation on the fortune for this week so as usual please stay home please stay safe and please stay healthy and if you gotta go out please be considerate and wear a mask until next week everyone have a good one